that? Will that work? There we go. Just need to pull uh -huh. that back a little bit. There we are. Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's Saturday night. It's OnCon. Yes, it is. Happy OnCon, everybody. Happy OnCon. OnCon 5. Uh, just got done with uh, four panels um, by uh, Steve here, as well as uh, Kira Fox, Ginger Gaiden. Thank you to both of you for those those uh, things. This is not Ginger Gaiden, by the way. This is John. Yeah, I I, I, I can't look as good as, as Kira does. Uh, just, <laughs> None of us just can. me. None of us can. No, no. Um, so, yes, it's been fun. We just got done with a charity auction. Um, getting uh, uh, getting bids on a whole bunch of cool anime stuff, which will be winging its way out here soon. And uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, moving in. But what we're going to talk Who about right now. Who got the cookies? Who got the cookies? <gasps> I, I, I got the cookies, but if yeah. Anime Lover would like them, all, all they have to do is send Brenton their address. And it's, it's I'm going to have to them. go back in there and, and look at what the hot bidding was yeah. for cookies. Yeah. I, it was I, not you'll not be very surprised. Ejected. You'll be, you'll be yeah. very surprised. Yeah. What? Uh, yeah. Yeah, su surprisingly cold bidding Damn. on the cookies. Um, granted, I should have offered my first-hand testimony from the cookies that I had, Brent, from, from Otakon. You're like, <laughs> first-hand testimony, people kill for these. Go. <laughs> <laughs> granted, the bidding on everything else was pretty hot. So I think folks were hitting their budgets pretty quickly oh. on, the, on the earlier items. So fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. fair enough. But we are here to talk about The Wind Rises. Yes. Hayao Miyazaki's most recent anime film. As of recording, um, who knows when he will finish, if he will finish um, um, his, his next film, because uh, boy, that's taken a while. But we get The Wind Rises, um, which is the story of, um, it's an interesting story, really. Um, and let's kind of start there. Um, so when you guys watch this, how familiar w with you how familiar were you with the story of um, Jiro Horikoshi? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's the first time for me. All right. <laughs> I, was, yep. I had heard I would heard about the development of the Zero and development of, of the aviation industry and avionics in, in Japan in pre-war period. But it, by far, the information usually skewed towards American and European developers. Sure. Yeah. Um, predominantly so that the, I, I, and, I, and it segued kind of nicely into the idea, like most Europeans and Americans were surprised mm. at the developments that were occurring in Japan, mm -hmm. especially once, you know, the eve of war came. Yeah. So watching this, I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. And then I, then later on, I found out it's not autobiography, you know, biographical. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. So it's not like absolutely accurate. Yeah. So I was like, yeah. oh, yeah. wait a minute here. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Steve, how yeah. So I knew about a, a, a roundabout idea of the actual true history of okay. it. You know, just, cool. just kind of name dates and this is what happened kind of thing. No, no, no details. And I thought, it, I thought I had seen this Ghibli movie before ah. and then uh, but then I realized as soon as we got to the earthquake mm. part part of it which was in a spectacular wow. moment of, an of animation there mm. I was like no nah, I would have remembered that <laughs> yeah. I would have yeah. remembered that and, you know even if I was even if I was in the midst of malt liquor I probably still would remember that one so what left an impression would you say yeah yes yeah yeah one of those yeah. things where it's like you know that could be playing on a 13-inch TV on the other side of the room, and you never forget it. Yeah. yeah. Oof. Um, and, and, you know, it's funny, because I think of that's that's the scene of that every time when I'm folding sheets. And this is really? when you when you go whoosh, with the sheets uh, to get them straight yeah. out. I'm just like, yeah. wow. <laughs> just watching that wave through the ground. Mm -hmm. I'm like, ooh. Um, yeah. Well, you guys knew more than I did coming into the movie. Um, <clears throat> you know, I basically knew that somebody designed the Zero at one point. <laughs> and this was about him. Uh, Great. Uh, so that was pretty much all I knew. And I do wonder if Miyazaki isn't kind of messing with us with this opening. Um, because it does start with this beautiful pan, um, 
uh, up to this large Japanese house, uh, farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere, uh, seemingly. And then this uh, this boy uh, sleeping there, um, uh, who then gets up and goes onto the roof to find this very fantastical looking plane, um, which he then climbs in and sets off. And you very quickly realize it's a dream sequence. Um, but with a lot of detail given to like that engine and that, that movement of the flaps right. and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so I think Miyazaki is kind of immediately playing around with fantasy and reality in this film, um, especially given the, you know, the uh, sort of bird wings on the sides. Yeah. Um, and, but then also, you know, again, that engine and then the like rope, um, uh, uh, joystick. Steering, joystick, yeah, with, with the mm -hmm. wood, which is just kind of very, very retro. And, and the throttle outside of the plane. Yeah. On the, on the... Yeah, like a, the wheel. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's funny because it is very much kind of a, you know, a 10 year old boy's mind's mishmash of different ideas. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, for the time period, too monoplanes were like a, the hottest new thing mm -hmm. and yet you had people making monoplanes basically on a on a biplane model wow right. so it's like yeah. just kind of tinkering with that idea of how mm -hmm. how can we just you know cut out the additional set of, of wings and get this thing as a monoplane so you have a lot of this like world war one styled engine technology a lot of the design technology mm -hmm. that would have been you know, it features very nicely in this sort of dream sequence, but it's also hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, wow. <clears throat> you know, the reality is by the time you get to the late 20s, there have been far greater right. developments. Right. So, the, yeah. so the amazing, yeah. fantastical flying machines of like the 1910s, you know, early, mid-1915, mm -hmm. 16 area, those, those are all gone. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So by the time you hit like mm -hmm. the middle 1920s into the 30s, you people have already moved on beyond yeah. that. But this is like a wonderful example of the futurism mm -hmm. of somebody that yeah, would have right. been around World War One to be like, oh, it'll be a great, it'll be these <laughs> mono wing airplanes, it'll be fantastic with, looking with, like with oh, everyone with one. feathers on the side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll fly to work. It'll be great. You're like you're high. Stop it. Where's my flying car already? Exactly. Um, and I thought it was interesting because, you know, with Porco Rosso, mm. you look at this and it's like, mm -hmm. obviously Miyazaki has a great respect for the, the and obviously Nausicaa, mm -hmm. um, for the aeronautic aspect, yeah. the flying aspect right. of things where it's like, mm -hmm. Porco Rosso has a much, you know, much more, you know, straightforward utilitarian where it's, mm -hmm. you see some repair aspects of it, but you, you know, the planes are extant. They're, mm -hmm. they're not really yeah. as functional uh, uh, bits and pieces in dream sequence as like you get out of this where it's like, someone's concept you know births forth mm -hmm. and then they can put it to paper and make that reality yeah it's like oh, okay yeah. gotcha okay i see i see how this the creative process yeah, it, it, it's very much miyazaki kind of indulging his love of all things aeronautics yeah. um completely agreed um complete with this absurdly expensive shot of the plane <laughs> flying down with the, the land going underneath it's all hand drawn you know Drawing by drawing, it's like I oh gosh, somebody spent like nine months on that. Um, Somebody's the animation crew is going, I hate you. Exactly. <laughs> Just stop it. No, I need it more beautiful looking. <laughs> Shut up and go away. <laughs> How much are you paying us? Um, Ninety four hundred yen <laughs> yeah. a year. Oh jeez. Um, and um, so this is set in nineteen eighteen. By the way, this this sequence, he's he's that that old at this point. Uh, it, it's it's um, that, that's a period. So and importantly, so that's uh, Taisho era. Yep. So the Meiji era is over. We're now moving into sort of modernism, um, uh, the, the modern world. Um, and then of so course, Taisho was nineteen twelve to nineteen twenty three. That sounds right. I think. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then of course the the dream is interrupted by the evil flying machines, um, uh, and a very classic thing. And what I, what I find kind of interesting is. A, they literally have an iron cross on them. Right. Uh, when he zooms yeah. in, it's like, huh, interesting. Um, well, you want to clearly establish who your bad guys are. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Oh. Yeah. Um, um, but also, um, um, 
and also obviously fantastical. What also I find interesting though is like the, these flying machines uh, and the way they 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 operate feel very much like those early Japanese science fiction stories of you know the the flying destroyer that the flying Japanese submarine. Used. Yeah, flying submarine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, you 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 f- defeat the Western powers. Yeah. Um, so playing around with that idea a little bit, um, uh, and then you know it gets destroyed. He wakes up, um, and we we all can tell it's a dream. Uh, so here is Jiro, um, who is this young boy at this crossroads in Japan. Um, uh, and I say that not just because I happen to stop on a frame where he is literally crossing a road. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is a very interesting point in Japanese history. And I think you see that interestingly in the film in general through clothing. Um, yeah. One thing music does a good job of mm-hmm. is in all of this, pretty much everyone's wearing traditional Japanese clothing. Um, by the time he's an adult, a lot of Western clothes are already in. Yeah. Um, but um, I also like that he transitions to, to the school and we see this odd anachronistic thing where it's it's a Japanese school. Like we all know what Japanese schools look like. There's the row of windows on one side and the doors on the other side and the little placards on top. But they're the old schoolhouse. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're the ones that were built, you know, pre-war, all of wood that now has um, Hanako's uh, chan in the bathroom. I was about to say, it's now haunted, <laughs> and it's somewhere off the corner of the school grounds. <laughs> the 1960s concrete box <laughs> yeah, replaced yeah. the nice wooden hand-hewn uh, buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you even see, like, all the slogans hanging on the side, which I'm sure say, you know, piety, education, you know, improve Make, yourself. Oh, wait a, <laughs> yeah. wait a minute. No, that mm, would have been mm, 10 years later. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> um, or 20 years. Yeah, 20, exactly. Um... Uh, and here we see Jiro's love of, of, uh, of aviation. Um, and I also kind of like the, the foreshadowing where they spend a lot of time animating his glasses and how they're these sort of, you know, uh, 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 what do you call them? Like Coke bottle glasses. Yeah. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Just very, very thick, very heavy. His eyesight's not good. Um, um, and then he gets into a fight, which allows Miyazaki to... Ram down our throats the the theme that the only time you ever get into a fight is to defend yourself, right? Which we see in anime all the time, and we see it's just kind of front and center. You know, we are, what, um, um, five minutes in, six minutes in. Yeah. Uh, it's like, okay, we're, 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 we're acknowledging, boom. Um, I was, I was it's just funny because it's in any, every anime ever, and it's like, okay, now Miyazaki's doing it. Um, um, but, uh, again, we're introduced to the sister and to the idea of these, these various, uh, folks who want to fly. Um, um, he has and a reference, re- reference back mm-hmm. to his glasses. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. the fact that, and I think you've pointed it out before. Mm-hmm. It's like the idea of making things that are clear, visible, mm-hmm. takes a lot mm-hmm. of work. To get that in, yeah. in a way where you're like, oh, he's just wearing frames. Be like, no, he's yeah. wearing glasses. So it's, <laughs> you know, that slightly yeah. kind of different coloration, the way that, the, you know, it's, it's adjusted and then to do it. It's like, oh, okay. Gotcha, There's gotcha. even a shot earlier, we'll see if I can grab it. Yeah, of the, the boy who has glasses from side on. And you can see his eyes, and you can also see his eyes in the glasses because yeah. of how they're, yeah, it's like, oh, gosh. That takes a lot of work to get it that way. <laughs> exactly. Uh. And, and, and there is that, as you're pointing out, John, that animators is like, what are you making me do this? Please. But I need to believe I, I their glasses. Cool. Yeah, shut up. I'll put frames on them. Can people guess from there, right? <laughs> I just want to go home. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I'm um, sleeping here under my desk. <laughs> Yutaki says, I slept under my desk every day for the past 30 years. Um, <laughs> Good for you. I have a wife and children. <laughs> so do I. I should have thought of that place. before you started working here. <laughs> ah, damn you. And of course, Yutaki says, so did I. And I just stayed in the office all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you have conjugal visits in jail. You, see, you have conjugal right. visits here. Uh-huh. Oh, jeez. It all worked out. Oh, huh, nice. Um, but, uh, and her grave of the fireflies well. Oh. Um, oh. Yeah. The, the two, so I also kind of like the, the foreshadowing a little bit of, you know, um, he says something on the lines of, you know, don't come out here, you'll catch cold. 
Um, the idea of you're getting disease later on. Um, uh -huh. Oh, yeah, that's a thing. Um, uh, yeah, and then here's where you're introduced to his uh, um, his imagined uh, 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 character. Um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, who Caproni this is Caproni. Thank you. Caproni. Yeah. Um, who was a known, you know, uh, uh, designer, avi um, aviation designer, <coughs> in real life, uh, and who kind of shows up to Jiro in his dreams and gives us the, the, the again, you know, the, what are you saying about this? Um, you know, is the wind rising? Yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. Uh, so there's, ah, there's, there's, your, there's your theme. The, the Italian yeah, it's like you feel that too about Fort. Yeah. You don't want anybody confused. You gotta make it no, clear. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, as we have, and to your point, all of these planes flying along, all of this animation of all of this stuff happening, but with this kind of um, um, slightly fantasized version of all these planes. Yeah. Um, which is a lot of fun. Uh, you're seeing all these things. But even though, even there, they have bombs strapped to them, which I do appreciate that. Yeah. That note. Um, and machine guns. And machine and guns. And there's machine like guns, little yeah. guys in the nose there. Mm -hmm. Yep, totally. Because <sighs> um, that was the thing that was happening. And again, this is the thing we, we kind of forget, is that there were so many wars and conflicts and battles and things going on in, in those those couple of decades of the early 20th century. Um, you know, kids grew up just knowing, oh yeah, there's a massive war over here in this part of the world, massive war over there. Um, so yeah, kind of interesting. Um... And then we get this amazing um, uh, plane, sort of a spruce goose esque. Although no, this, this is smaller than that. Um, <laughs> but I just love the um, the the uh, wallpaper inside. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like you're would, a Would you really want to ride? Would you really like to really want to ride in something like that? <laughs> Where you're like after a while, you're like my yeah, eyes are exactly. hurting. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, but very much, you know, again, and we're, we're heading into the 20s, the era of exuberance and all of this this stuff, the golden age, uh, the gilded age, rather. With uh, the, the the bomber style, the design reminded me of very much of the World War One, the end of the war. The Germans mm -hmm. had fielded beyond the attempts to get Zeppelins over. Mm -hmm. Sure, you know, you get yeah. them there to England mm -hmm. to bomb, mm -hmm. uh, but, if, you know, if you hit it with an incendiary <laughs> round, the hydrogen tends to explode, <laughs> so it's kind of a yeah. bad deal. Yeah. Um, they came up with the Gotha bomber, which was this mm -hmm. large, yeah. hmm. sort of very similar to that shape. Interesting. Kind yeah. of bomber that could, if it was stationed in Belgium, it could kind of get there. It could get to the coast. They, it, they it did, did I, actually, they did fly them from... Um, they did fly them from the coast to England. Yeah, um, but it was like when they could see fuel inefficient, <laughs> but, right? And the the thing of it is, is it was crewed by seven people, Oof. and um and um one of them, the engineer, was tasked, and this was on the Zeppelins as well, mm. where they were trained to walk on the wing to get to the engine because ah, they could actually. There's an actual access them. panel. Yeah. The access panel to get inside of the engine to fix them if something were to happen, which yeah, was quite yeah. often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah. And they had those nose and the, the people in front of the of the plane the, with mm -hmm. machine guns, that was a thing that, that, that you mm -hmm. know, they, yep. they did wow. that. And the the back to the Zeppelins and towards the beginning of, of the movie, when they're showing the, the uh, I thought it was kind of interesting that he, the dream happened during day because most of the Zeppelin mm. attacks were, were at night. Yeah. And, um, and you know, and that weird bomb dropping thing where they're just like, ah, here's a bomb. We're just going to smash it and then we're going to bring it back up. Yeah. Because you know? the bombs never actually went anywhere. But I mean, that's, that's the yeah. dream sequence. So it's inserting yeah. the Zeppelin experience into, which I, I, you know, at the time, during World War One, the Zeppelin attacks on London were like Perfect. huge yeah, news. Huge. Yeah. The idea that you could field something that could not just be an artillery piece that was limited by 20 miles, but you could mm. fly something, oh, I don't know, 100 miles. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and then bomb things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, ineffectually. But <laughs> psychologically, mm -hmm. it yep. was amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And then to your point, you know, uh, to our earlier point, you know, we, we the, the flyby of the plane with all the people looking out 
of the window, hideously, hideously time consuming to animate. Um, yeah. But we get we get it because we have to show all of them in, in you know moving, uh, you know full. Yeah. Uh, Which again, the China Clipper in the yep. in the nineteen twenties and thirties, big flying boats that would fly mm -hmm. from from Hawaii to Guam to Midway wow. to yeah. whatever yeah. else to connect. Yeah. Mm. the western coast of the united states to china and japan mm. Mm. so it's a big flying boat experience. Made, made for great movie series yes, yes. <laughs> although i imagine that design would would wow <laughs> yeah. yeah wow that's a lot more lift and probably a lot less like propulsion than you're gonna need to do the thing you're trying to do but that's fine yeah i just say fantasy um um, but yeah, and I, I do like this idea of having this mentor, of needing a mentor and not having one in real life and so sort of inventing one, um, which is kind of, kind of the idea is that, you know, there is no one in Japan designing right. airplanes at the time that you can right. go up to and say, hey, sir, could you please mentor me? Uh, so he has to think up Caproni, uh, which does make sense. Um, uh, and then you say, uh, uh, wakes up, and now we, we jump forward to him as a young man, um, um, uh, commuting on a train, um, where he sees um, a girl nearby uh, who, who might have a problem with her hat, who knows, uh, very kind of classic shoujo moment there, very sweet, very nice, um, um, as he tries to protect her. Um, um, and it's a beautiful, quiet day. <clears throat> nothing, nothing really happening. It's, it's a beautiful the, yeah, train ride. Like I'm going to sit outside on, on the step of yeah. this rickety train and mm -hmm. read my little book, and I know I'm not going to fall off, but, mm -hmm. you know, okay, well, we'll suspend this place there. <laughs> Which, you know, trains, you know. Well, I was going to say, but you're going to figure at the point in time that this is occurring, you know, trains themselves were, were still kind of new as well. Mm -hmm. Aircraft yeah. alone yep. would have been a futuristic sci-fi world, mm -hmm. but trains themselves are are still, you know, not that old. No, absolutely, well, you're right. No, and, and that's actually I felt like the point of like every time they showed a train because they showed a train a lot in this, and which is to say, hey, you can actually do this because you're doing this thing. Yes, yeah. yeah. Which is is which is the train. So of course you can do these other things. A source of optimism, as long as you know something tragic doesn't happen to the train. Yeah, yeah, and Tokyo. Um, in Tokyo. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The, the entire Kanto plane. Yeah. 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 Um, as long as nothing happens, everything will be fine. Right. Um, and yeah, and you get the, some of these stunning images of um, first the, the the rolling of all of the the houses. Um, yeah. And one of the things I love about this is that you could have done this with a multi plane camera in 1935. Um, it's basically like 12 layers of houses painted, you know, stacked behind right. each other and right. you just move the, 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 you know, the one in the back and add dust clouds and move the one in the front. Um, it's vastly easier <laughs> with digital compositing. Um, but conceptually, yeah. you know, it, it would work. Um, and I think it's one of the things that um, often separates Miyazaki from other filmmakers. Is he still thinks that way. You know, his shots are still composed as though there's a multi-plane camera everything is going to be, be, be done on. Um, and it gives you kind of that vintage feel. Um, uh, but yeah, and you, you see all these, and then you see that the houses actually animated, rippling. Yeah. Oh. Um, which is interesting. Which is a, it's a stunning visual effect. It is. Yeah, it, um, is. it really is. Again, it's another one of those where it's like, I can't imagine you know people being like, oh, crap, we have to do what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, well you, the result you know, is amazing. Yeah. Well, so when it happened mm. and the, the earthquake and the, the big wave that goes through mm. that goes through the land the pulse. and, you know, it's literal, literal wave mm -hmm. wave. And, you know, I, I've never seen a, a obviously an earthquake of that magnitude. The last time I was in an earthquake, I actually slept through it. <laughs> um, the one here in Baltimore a few mm. years ago, about 10, 15 years ago. Mm. Um, and uh, but like at first I thought when I saw that happening, I'm going, 
Totoro's coming out of the earth? What? <laughs> I don't. Huh? Wait, this went kaiju real quick. Where, yeah. Where, where, yeah. Where, I didn't even see that left hand turn. Uh, we have um, to develop the zero to fight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. That's where this film's going. Uh, okay. I got it, got it. But then when it was, you know, going through the motion and you actually saw the train and you know the things and then people reacting to us like, wow, this is this is it's one of those things, like I was saying earlier, if you don't remember this scene from this movie, it means that you didn't watch it because there's no way you cannot not remember this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, just, it's just visually just there. Well, it's also interesting the different sort of approaches he takes. Like when, um, um, when you get to the, um, these houses in, in, in the one shot, there's this sinuousness to how all of the houses move. Right. Yeah. Um, which is not the case in the later shot when you see the, uh, the, the, the train tracks. They're all, you know, one object that's being thrown around. Um, because I think that's, you know, when you imagine seeing that, you know, because close up, you imagine seeing that. When you imagine far away, it's like Tinker Toys being thrown up. Right. Um, and it, it kind of it just works for, the, for that shot. Um, but, but I'll tell you what was scary in, in, in this. In, not that it frightened me, but I was like, God, yeah. that would be scary. Yeah. So they're off the train, they jump off the train. Mm. Smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. Jump off the train, and they're on the hill. And they crouch down, which is kind of what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And they're sitting there, and everyone's kind of taking stock of everything. And everything. you're like, okay, okay, we're going to go on to the next. And yeah. everyone just stops. Because that's the aftershocks. And, you yeah. know, you're just like, oh, oh, crap. Yeah, that's right. It's an earthquake. There's going to be more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there is. <laughs> yeah. I go around like, yeah. I see um, earthquake hits Baltimore. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Thank you for the dramatic uh, the, the <laughs> reenactment, Steve. We appreciate that. Um, well, and what, what I also find interesting is that that causes them to kind of look up and look around, um, which is when they notice. Um, um, I'll see if I can get the shot here. Um, where is that? Um, uh, they notice plumes of smoke. Mm -hmm. And somebody goes, fire yeah and it's like and, oh, oh. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah earthquake's bad but fire's fire terrifying. Is fire. yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and again you you know you, we we think about or we hear about how terrible fire was back in the day and in tokyo and then you see all of these houses packed together yep. right and you're like oh yes like that, that makes sense it's just there's there's nowhere else for it to go but everywhere and I love how they make the point of it that it's just the fire is just arbitrary because they show yeah. only the one house that's actually starting to catch on fire mm -hmm. as, and then how quickly yeah. it spreads. Mm -hmm. And you get and it doesn't say it, doesn't show it, doesn't tell you, but you can only just imagine that, yep, it's somebody's kettle, it's somebody's right. mm -hmm. oven, it's a stove, it's something Cold that just cooker that fell yeah, over. Fell yeah. over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's all it took to, you know, make it go. Yeah. And yeah, the people are are crowded in much less the houses uh um um uh, yeah and so folks have start to have got to start to move and as you say the fire just starts spreading at a fantastic rate um i also just love kind of the the theme of this that just okay everyone comes together everyone okay how are you doing we're gonna set your arm we're gonna do this we're gonna do this what do we have to do next um and there you know people aren't really panicking they're just shocked and then figuring out what to do next um and again because earthquakes are not new but you're still you're reacting in in the moment uh, which i think it was very well portrayed in this um and yeah and then <laughs> the crush of gosh the crush of people just trying to get anywhere um just horrific and again thinking about what it you know what it must be like and um you know how to actually do anything, how to actually make any progress there. Um, and just the horror of that. Um, so yeah, so eventually he takes her back. She, she finds her family. Um, and I also appreciated this again, where she sees her family, um, rushes off and like, that's it. Like she doesn't really think to thank him or go back to him or whatever. And he, I'll see if I can find the, the shot of this. Um, she does look back temporarily, um, but he just kind of sees this and then leaves. He's like, yes, 
you're safe, good. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm going on with things. Like I would like for there to be more here, but that's not the important thing right now. Uh, which I think was wise. Um, uh, yeah, and then the books. Oh, this is a, a, a sequence that just uh, got to me. Um, all the students stacking up all the books to try to save as many as possible um, in the hopes they don't burn. And the dude lights a cigarette. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting right there. Can I have a smoke? Just inhale. <laughs> exactly. At that point, just inhale. You, you'll be fine. Yeah, three quarters of the city's on fire. You've got plenty of ash in the air. <laughs> you'll be fine. <laughs> but it's not nicotine. Oh, uh, <laughs> yep. Um... Uh, so we get another dream sequence, um, as Jiro is probably kind of processing this, looking for something a little lighter and brighter. Um, and what's interesting is how it's actually like literally contrasted with reality. Um, it's like he's going back and forth between his dream and reality and seeing all of these all these things and all this imagery um, um, as he's trying to trying to deal with this. And then we get shots. Straight out of Grave of the Fireflies. Um, of yeah. All of the, the death and destruction, or just the destruction, I suppose. Um, you know, and them getting the water out of the, the, the pipe. Um, again, I think Miyazaki's like, yep, remember this thing? I'm, I'm pointing you to this thing. Um, and it's not even World War II yet. Ugh. Yeah. I know, I was just like, I was like, hey, didn't want you to see this at Grave of the Fireflies. Why? 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 Yeah. Why? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. We still got a number of a, a number of years to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gosh. Um, someday, someday that two by four of his has got to splinter. Someday. No, never. <laughs> <laughs> he will never splinter the two by four. He beats you over the head with things. <laughs> never. Um, and so we we cut forward again to uh, a nation rebuilding. Um. And this is only, I believe, three years later. I'm double checking. Mm -hmm. um, I think so. When, when we uh, move forward to this. So 26? Um, uh, 20, um, let's see here. Uh, 23, it's uh, four years later. Excuse me, 27. 27. Um, um, as he has graduated um, and uh, ends up getting a job. Uh, we'll, we'll get there here in a second. Um, um, oh well, yes, we we get, we get his sister shows up, um, and uh, we have a little conversation with her, and all the stuff happening with her. Um, uh, and they have a, a a nice little time there, just kind of Tokyo in 1927, kind of seeping you in that time um, where things seem pretty well back to normal. Um, and then yeah, another train trip. Gets off the train um, and uh, uh, goes to his job at Mitsubishi, um, which is kind of funny. And then we get his boss, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe my favorite character in the film. I would, I'll bet he's based on someone. He's got to be. He's got to be yeah. based on yeah. someone he's in the anime industry be. that, like, you know, was just worked a toy or something. That yeah, there's just got to be. Um, never satisfied, always pissed off, um, uh, and takes him uh, for his first job, where he's going to des design a plane. Um, <clears throat> and here's where we get to, I think, one of the more interesting elements of the, the movie, the fact that it's kind of about the world of work. Um, there's so much time and attention paid here to the desks, the, the books on the yeah. desks, the, the, the paperwork. Just all these various little things about their work environment um, that is clearly very carefully thought out. Little brush on on the on the side, and all these things, and because this is where you live your life, you know, making yeah. things. Um, um, as he kind of gets to it and um, starts starts designing stuff, uh, goes in and actually spends some time with the prototype. I thought was interesting. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it, they, it came across, as I recall, that this is unusual, that the engineers usually don't spend much time in the hangar. Um, and I don't know if that's, that, that was common or not, or if that's just kind of a movie plot point. I don't know. Um, which is kind of interesting. 
Well, as I say, I know for a lot of the drafts people, at least as, as far as it got, you know, the, the bits and pieces I watched about draftsmanship during mm-hmm. the U.S. Right. experience of World War II, mm-hmm. um, you had, you know, everybody doing their calculations, everybody doing their paperwork, and then, you know, getting it all together, mm-hmm. looking at the loads, looking at the, the various factors involved. And then those draftsmen just kept moving on. But that's uh, because there would be like a hundred of them working oh, on various yeah, aspects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. This... You know, that's the funny <laughs> part is it's like the interesting sort of, you know, you have the fantastical dream sequence. Mm. Then you have this catastrophic earthquake event and the rebuilding of a nation. And the rebuilding of the nation is doing technologically advanced things, but doing it like you would if you were a solo inventor. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So here's yeah. this person who's coming up, who's drafting these things up and looking at all the loads and all the, you know, coming to the calculations. And yet it's still so hands-on that he's going and <laughs> literally looking at what's going on with it. And it's like, okay, I get I get the point that you're that you're yeah. kind of driving here is like the Japan of the past, even though it's layered in yeah. modern things, is still an old mm-hmm. modernism. Yeah. You know, it's like they're yeah. not they're they're advancing in technology, but they're not changing the way that they're doing things to right. get to that technology. Yeah. And it's but like they're oh. still working in wood. Right, they're still making wooden planes. Um, I also suddenly realized that you know those, uh, you know those folks working in the in, in the U.S. were probably a hundred miles from where it was being manufactured. Right, um, yeah. whereas here, wherever, everything... wherever the head Boeing office yeah. was versus the actual plant building mm-hmm. the thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, whereas here it's it's you know a hundred people, all of them doing this thing, all in this one facility. Like they're all here. Yeah. Like wow. within like a two hundred foot radius of each other. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. cool. Are you done with it? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna build it now. All right. <laughs> Give me the hammer. Yeah. Right. Totally. This span should go from there to there and connect to that spar. Okay. Should it look like that? Yeah. Perfect. Oh no, put that screw in there. There you go. Ha, perfect. <laughs> oh. um, uh, yeah. And you get the. I think to further drive that home, the fact that there's the, the cattle, you know, just like one fence away from them. You know, they're like. Wow, yeah, this is kind of rural. Uh, it's kind of weird. Um, yeah, but he does say, it, it, they're saying, well, it takes them most of the day just to get the thing out with the, with the oxen. And, and, you know, he Jared just kind of looks, looks at him and goes, well, I like them. So, <laughs> okay, no, you're supposed to move. No, move on. You're supposed to use it. Okay, never mind. Yeah. yeah. Tractor would have been nice, but okay. Mm-hmm. But I mean, yeah. I think that's that's you know Miyazaki yeah. making the real but point right. about that. It's just like yeah. mm-hmm. you know, in the not to say European, but in the other industrialized mm-hmm. countries, the right. the processes and the production are like not sanitary, but, but they yeah. are removed to places that are conducive to that thing. Yeah. Well, the and process- here they are doing this thing, and yeah. there's cattle well, next door. <laughs> I, I think. I think what it was was that you and I probably, I, John, I think you and I have probably read or seen the same things, but I think what it was was that the process was every bit as important as the product was. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in and what made some of the, the nations advance so far, like the Germans, was that they said, okay, well, we need to have a tractor to move this plane here A to B. What kind of tractor are we going to make? Okay, well, we're going to make this kind of tractor. They'll get it done, mm-hmm. right? And then they go, well, how do we make that tractor? So it's, it affects all things. Whereas, you know, in, whereas the Japanese are just like, going, oh, well, we got the ox. That's fine. That's good. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, we're making a plane. We don't plane. need a tractor. <laughs> right. Like, exactly. Uh, right. You know, uh, well, it would help you. The to, manufacturing okay. base is really helpful. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, that flywheel on that tractor also can be used in the plane. Hey. You know, <laughs> Yep. Can't feed a plane on on uh, grain and grass now, can you? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is fascinating seeing you know, seeing a country that is trying to leapfrog, you know, yeah. trying to go so far, uh, like you say, with without the manufacturing base, kind of doing their best there. Um, and uh, as yeah. you had pointed out with Lane and the Iwakura mission, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. you know, it's like just you're you're pulling every string you can from every quarter that you can to catch up mm-hmm. and it's like wow okay that that's great because that helps you move forward mm-hmm. <laughs> but if you're not if you haven't organically gotten there you have so many segments of the population yeah. so many segments of your economy of your industrial complex that just aren't there 
-hmm. You know, it's very right. difficult yeah. to like have the pieces, parts, you well, know, the tractor that pulls the yeah. thing that makes the other thing that leads you there. You just build the super advanced thing. And it's like, okay, you pull it on a cart with oxen. Like, wow. Right. <laughs> and, and, and even further, okay, you build one. Great. You know, and, and you've had to do everything to do it. How are you going to build 200? Yeah. You know, if you don't have In anything else going. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's wow. Yeah. It's, you know, it's not shed. Ford production plant <laughs> yeah. where you've got like <laughs> lines of production. It's a shed. <laughs> like, I, I know. And, and they had to share the shed because it was like, oh, well, I'm building the bomber, the mid range bomber <laughs> over here. Oh, well, I'm building the, the, the fighter plane right next to you. Yeah. Yep. Where's the assembly line? Hmm. <laughs> Those ten guys are in right there. <laughs> oh boy, um, yeah. Um, and then I do. Which is in and of itself, if you think about the age of like the Bugatti, like the the hand built, yeah. hand Jesus. luxury machines yep. of the early twenties, the late teens, you know, post World War One. Mm -hmm. Yes. Awesome. When they built three of them a year, yep. those right. things were Im <laughs> uh, immaculately made. Mm -hmm. And then when they said, let's make 10, quality <laughs> kind of went down a little. <laughs> yep. Um, it's how things are. Um, mm -hmm. you know, watch some Top Gear sometimes for, uh, for stories of cars that are, you know, they are perfect and they cost $30 million each. <laughs> yep. yep. Um, anyway, and then uh, it, it comes in for the landing. Um, and, uh, um, um, well, doesn't <laughs> quite do that. Uh, well, it lands. It lands. It's true. <laughs> it stops, being stops being in the air. The, <laughs> the ground stopped it. The ground stopped yeah, it. Yeah, the ground stopped it. Important. Yeah. Proof um, of gravity is important in all things. <laughs> mm, yeah. Uh, and I, I do love the, the starkness of the scene where it's flying, it's flying, and then just, it just crumbles and just thunk. You know, that's what happens. Um, yeah. And it's, it's tragic, obviously. Um, at least the pilot does uh, manage to get out. Um, but... Well, isn't he catapulted out in the first place? <laughs> I think so. Like, there's no shoot. He's just like... Ah. <laughs> thrown, thrown free from, <laughs> the, from, the, from the vehicle. Yeah. yeah. Um, but at least you see him coming down on, on, you know, in a parachute. At least there's, yeah. there's possibility of, of not dying horribly. Um, He's just going to get his pay docked by the amount of that <laughs> plane just <laughs> right. Exactly. Oh, geez. Um, so, yeah. So that is definitely a thing. Um, and then, sorry, there we go. Um, um, and yeah, there's the, the, the frustration. Uh, well, that was our prototype. Yeah. Mm. Um, and um, uh, and then we get another little grave of the fireflies moment, uh, where he offers the, the the cake to the kids. Um, uh, in effort to be nice, uh, which they refuse. Uh, because they don't trust him. He's just some some random, OG son. Yeah. Uh, and run off. Um, and. Now we get to see his kind of exhaustion of just, boy, this is tough. And there's, you know, what's going to happen? How do we, how do we get out of this? Um, um, and then the Germans show up. <laughs> Which, by the way, the, the, the prototype plane mm. and his, even his dream plane are somewhat takes of late World War I German aircraft. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and then by the time obviously you get to the giant Goethe bomber kind of flying wing thing, that's kind of like some sort of bastardized World War One and the the mm. uh, Horton two two nine flying yeah. wing, yeah. where it's just like, okay, this is a lot of interesting influences here. <laughs> <laughs> well, all the way down to the uh, the Ju fifty two with the sort of uh, the the corrugated steel exterior. Right. Um, yeah. Aluminum, I'm mm -hmm. guessing. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and the contrast <laughs> between the thing they built and this yeah. giant, shiny metal behemoth. <laughs> it looks like it's 50 years ahead of the plane they built. It's like, oh, oh, <laughs> you poor guys. Yeah. 
Um, Which really, you think about that for all the hand laboring they did on the prototype that didn't work. <laughs> obviously, this thing was not built by two dudes on right. the other yeah, side exactly. of the ship. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, right. okay, that means all of your like, uh, you know, neat fighter and advanced, you know, high speed flying. And nope, everybody over there <laughs> work on the giant thing. Well, I mean, you get the contrast of the of, of him walking into the into the shed and just like looking at the one prototype and going, "Oh, look at this little springy thing here," and everyone's just kind of, "Oh, okay, that's brilliant, brilliant." Then they go in and see the German Uber bomber, and it's just like, <laughs> and you just look at it and just go, oh, "I thought I was smart." <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> Damn it! Um, and again, Miyazaki, and I, I like I love in this shot. You see every single rivet. You know, all the yeah. way down, just all of the engineering required to build this thing. It's just, oh, God. We can Which, hear the ghost of that animator. <laughs> How much are you paying me? <laughs> no, I want this, like, you know, articulating arm for the flap to look like, shut up. <laughs> Go away, old man. I don't want to hear your ideas. <laughs> Um, which uh, I mean, for the for the manufacturing process, given their their the primitive <laughs> primitive place they're working, it's like no way. This is like the entire aluminum output <laughs> all <laughs> of in this thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and I mean, it's just like uh, it's lavishly covered with like corrugated aluminum. <laughs> like when uh, when when price is no problem. Yes, just exactly. Keep adding on corrugated aluminum. <laughs> Oh, um, and yet Jiro is not depressed. He's just kind of going on and, and processing. One of the things Miyazaki said is that he wanted to present somebody. He said um, Jiro was a genius and he had that tendency of geniuses to be kind of um, rather quiet, very kind of direct in his language. He didn't talk a lot, um, which is actually a problem for a, a movie when your hero you know, doesn't talk a lot. Um, and so he, he didn't really get discouraged in the way that the average person would about these things. It was his passion. He was going to get there. Um, and so this was just, this is a great opportunity to see how other people build things. Um, um, although the, the Germans don't always see it the same way. Um, yeah. We had this, this little, yeah. little moment with the Germans, um, which I think was interesting because it, it is kind of foreshadowing. It, it's, a, it's a very sort of, you know, the Nazis putting a hand on Indiana Jones' shoulder kind of a moment. Right, yeah. Uh, it feels... We're going that direction, um, um, but they're they're uh, uh, saved by Mr. Junkers, if I recall correctly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, right, him. U fifty two, the Junkers. Yeah. Uh, mm, that's aircraft a, guy. Yeah, I recognize that name. Well, uh, I thought too. The Indiana Jones moment is very interesting because at the time, this is post war Reichswehr. Yeah, they were not yeah. really all that particularly mm -hmm. menacing because the Weimar yeah, Republic yeah. was supposed to be was supposed to be a a very westernized and very you know liberalized representative government in mm -hmm. Germany. Yep. On the surface, <laughs> yeah, and this is twenty nine. Oops. So Oops. yeah, so we're, that's yeah. still we're still talking four years yeah. away from from uh, Adolf the party the power. Yeah, yeah so. you're absolutely right. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Um, so what I thought was kind of nicely done was <clears throat> in, they're, they're in the, the, the plane, the Uber bomber of the future mm -hmm. and they're flying and they got that choice seats, the two of them, he and this yeah. friend are in that, and they're like, you know, looking at it and just enjoying the ride. And they're like, kind of looking over at the other window and they're mm -hmm. like seeing all the other guys like, you know, face <laughs> pressed against glass. And they're talking about how and it's the constant conversation that they walk away from and then come back, which is, it's a shame that this is being used for bombs. This could be the, mm. the, the way to transport people, to transport things, yeah. to do this and that and the other thing. And they're still talking about while they're sitting there in this luxurious seat inside this wonderful plane. Mm. And then, you know, one of their, I guess, supervisors comes in and goes, no, 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 you guys need to take a back seat because the army guys need to be up here. Mm. And it's just like, going, oh, yeah, we forgot what the priority was. Yeah, We're, we're supposed to be... Okay, what Making we want is not more. is is yeah. not as important yeah. as to what you know you want. Yeah, but they are willing to go along with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's it's what one of the things Miyazaki brought up, <laughs> as he put it, um, there are all sorts of reasons not to make this movie, uh, <laughs> given the subject matter <laughs> yeah. and so forth. Uh, 
um, and he said one of the big things he wrestled with was how he presents somebody who built a weapon of war, you know, and knew he was doing it. And his kind of solution was saying he's a complex person, you know, he he didn't believe in war, he didn't agree with war, but he was also a patriot, and he also loved to build aircraft. And so he was going to build aircraft if that's what needed to be done. Um, and so you're right, they, they keep coming back to this theme of, gosh, I wish we didn't have to do this, so to speak. And I think it's just, you know, how he is able to move forward with that. You know? Well, you know, he has his made up mentor from real life in his dreams telling him, yeah, well, I had to, I had to do that too. So, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's part of the, part of the spiel. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, part of the Until price to get your dream paid. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, then you got 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, yeah, and then his, uh, uh, the dream to your point. Um, let's see here. Um, flashing forward to, uh, through um, more of these, uh, these shots, um, of, as you see, the dream sequence and all this stuff. And again, just, okay, so let's, let's put this out there. This film t feels a tad self indulgence at times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's just, a lot of long shots of planes flying just over and over and over again. Um, although I will point out in this shot, the uh, the pirate captain from Poco Rosso is, is flying the plane, which is kind of fun. Yeah, I was about to say that's Poco Rosso right there in the <laughs> pilot seat there. Yeah. Um, but there is this odd feeling of just like, there's just this overabundance of, of movement and animation in almost the entire movie. Um, um, just kind of making his point as strongly as he possibly can uh, uh, can do so. Um, Which arguably for the subject matter, it's not it by itself the the sort of dry issue of the guy who designed the zero mm -hmm. doesn't lead to any of this. No. So it's like you know if you were gonna like <laughs> you were it would be interesting you know proposition be like I'm gonna do this anime and it's about this guy and the mm -hmm. development of zero. And you, I just imagine people being like, well, okay, so it's a history lesson, so it's not gonna, it's gonna be very interesting. And Miyazaki's like, oh no, it's gonna go totally fantastic. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna do a left hand turn pretty soon. Oh, here. yeah. And then, and then we're gonna, you know, we're gonna the lavish fuel dream you. sequences in here, all <laughs> kinds of stuff. You're like, okay. <laughs> so is it really pertinent to the story? Bah, oh. it's character building. <laughs> it's, 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 it's pretty, pretty to to look at. At. <laughs> exactly. it's pretty to look at. Exactly. It's pretty to look at. Model kits will fly off the shelf. <laughs> yeah, yes. Hold on. Hold oh, on. I would buy model kits of these. Absolutely. Um, well, they have Porco Rosso like yeah, die cast yeah, the plane, yeah. so mm -hmm. I've not seen any of this yet. But because um, <laughs> there's nothing problematic about this film, um, <laughs> it's a big matter. Um, <laughs> it's controversial. Um, well, Miyazaki pointed this out. He when when he first got the idea for it, he actually did a he actually drew it as a manga. Um, and did a couple issues of that and then kind of put it to, to rest. And then Suzuki came back to him and said, I think this would make a good film. And he's like, like I said, absolutely not. Ghibli makes family films. This is not a family film. It's not a family-friendly uh, subject. No, it's not going to happen. And then at some point, Suzuki, uh, I think it was Suzuki who said, um, um, children should be allowed to see things and be exposed to things that they're uncomfortable with. He's like, he's like, hmm, hmm, and he thought about it for a while, and eventually decided to make the film. Is, so I, I do wonder. Is that if where he thought? Is that where he thought it was okay to bring children to his summer home and give them chainsaws? <laughs> Probably, yeah. Unsupervised. Yeah. Actually, that was formative, right there. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Around the same time, he developed the uh, Totoro's God of Death. Right. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> what? No, no, no. Shh. Quiet on that. Uh, yeah, so we, we boy, um, so, but I do wonder if these dream sequences are kind of a way of making this more approachable as a family film, um, right. uh, because the rest of the, the, um, the material is certainly serious, but, you know, obviously there's no intestines, you know, it's not Monoke, right? It's much right. less right, yeah. that, um, so yeah. Well, just even the, the shot that. from Porco Rosso would be the pirate captain. <laughs> There's a whole family in the front of a bomber, bomber. waving yeah. like, hey, this is great fun. You're like, oh, yep. this, is, this is so light and so enjoyable. <laughs> airy. Family just, film. Oh. Exactly. Airy. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> exactly. Lots of things in the air. Exactly. Holding a little infant. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Um. I mean, it's wonderful. It's, it's an amusing, charming, charming mm -hmm. adventure. Yes, totally. 
pillow uh, crashes and everything dies. <laughs> For sure, Steve, go there. <laughs> um, um, yeah, and then we get, um, yeah, then then we, we get the again just the banging on it again when they go out flying together, um, and the engine starts spitting oil everywhere. Um, they all get covered with it, and they realize, oh, this isn't going to work. Um, yeah, on on these, <laughs> oh, these aircraft carriers that are. You know, like three feet long to go. The uh, we're well, only going seventy-five miles an hour. Pfft, yeah, that's right. They were about the size of what an Ohio class is now submarine. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, that's about in terms yeah. of length. Yeah. In terms of wow. Length. Um, well, they weren't. But a portion of them were converted World War One cruisers. Yep. Some of yep. them uh, were con- like some of the short jump carriers were converted. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just like. Wow, literally, a oh, shipping literally. boat with a platform on it. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, this is awesome. And we're going to put some five pounders on here and uh, off you go. There yep. You go. Yep. Yeah. Onward to the motherland. Put some, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so let's put some cannons on here. That won't be useful because if anybody hits this thing, it's going to go up like a Roman <laughs> candle. <laughs> but you guys on the boat think that you got guns and you feel good. So go off, <laughs> fly, yeah, fly, sail, do the thing. Don't worry, you'll just reincarnate. You have exactly. all the cargo with you. If you truly believe in it, you'll right. be fine. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and then another crash. Um, um, and um, let's see here. Um, yeah, and then we he gets sent off to to relax and to recharge because of all these failures. And to Steve's point, suddenly Shoujo. Um <laughs> I mean, I almost had the whiplash. I mean, I, you know, going from one point, like it literally, he's just like looking at the, the wreckage of the plane that he yeah. is totally responsible for at this point. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he walks away and you're like, oh, poor guy. The next thing you know, pretty girl. Hey. I'm like, wait a minute. We're... Ow, ow, yeah. ow. Whiplash. Yeah. Is this the pivot point in this film? Apparently. <laughs> like, pivot away from no, the plane. Uh, Pivot to romance. It's, it's funny you say that because I actually did hit pause and see where I was. <laughs> it was and it was close to about halfway, actually. Yep. Mm-hmm. At the moment. Um, now, Miyazaki famously, whenever he makes a movie, um, he does a lot of sketches and paintings and so forth. And he eventually stops when he finds a, a painting that represents the movie to him. Um, and I believe this is, this is that, that image of her painting on the hillside I uh, with, with him you know, behind her. Um, that was kind of what, what summed up the film to him, um, um, if I recall correctly. Um, uh, and yeah, then we have you know, he rescues her her umbrella as a gentleman should, um, and and brings it back. Uh, and then we have our our um, our just sudden sudden onset shoujo. Um, if only there had been a moment where he could have said something like, your umbrella can fly, unlike everything I designed. You know what I mean? Like, that would have been a sweet intro. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, something like that. Yeah. Quippy, funny little thing. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so, uh, yeah, so he has dinner. He sees her. She seems unhappy. We, we get a sense something's going on here. Um, uh, and then we, we get them um, interacting for the first time. And I got to say... There's something a little Makoto Shinkai about these sequences. Um, or there may be something very Makoto Shinkai about these sequences. Um, but there's something about just, you know, two young people meeting kind of shyly, uncertain about each other. Something about the way the shots are composed, very kind of cheesecloth over the, the camera feel to them a little bit. Um, there's something kind of interesting. Um, and then you get Werner Herzog. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That totally threw me because I didn't want, I didn't read the, the the cast list and I watched the English stuff and then, hello young man or you know however his voice is I'm just like going, oh, what? Me, me, in a Miyazaki? What? Yes. Um, so yeah. Just don't ask questions, Steve. Just go with it. So let's let's, let's yes. talk about that real quick. Um, this is really interesting because um, I'll make sure we get this correct. Um, uh, make sure I have the right. Yeah, so uh, Jiro and uh, Castor, this um, uh, strange man, 
um, who he encounters, uh, both have very interesting voice actors um, in, in Japanese as well as in English. Um, the voice of the, the foreigner is Stephen Alpert, who was the head of Studio Ghibli's foreign relations for years. He worked with oh, Studio Ghibli forever. Um, oh. He's the one who released the, the, the book last year about his time in Studio Ghibli. Mm. Um, and, and this guy's actually patterned off him. He, he looks like Stephen Alpert. Um, hmm. So this is literally a guy who, who, you know, does not know Japanese very well. I mean, I mean I, I, maybe, who knows Japanese very well, but cannot necessarily pronounce it perfectly all the time, right? Right. Um, doing this voice. Um, and then Werner Herzog in the, the, the English dub. Um, and I think partly because they do want this idea of somebody who isn't speaking English fluently, you know, who has that heavy accent and so forth. Right. Um, and he is speaking to uh, Jiro Horikoshi, who is voiced by Hideaki Anno, the director of Neon Genesis Evangelion. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, that's it, a hell of a cast. It's a hell of a casting. <laughs> well, the backstory that's fascinating because uh, they, they did a bunch of, 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 of auditions. Nobody sounded right. And because, again, Miyazaki said he needs to have this sort of um, directness to him. You know, he's a genius. He needs to have this directness of, I'm just going to get things done. And nobody got that around. And apparently he and Suzuki were talking, and Suzuki said, we should, we should totally cast Anno-san. Like, you know, we, we worked with Anno for years. We should totally cast Anno. And they both laughed. And Miyazaki was like, ha, ha, ha. Hmm. <laughs> huh. And they both kind of looked at each other, and they're like, no, no. No, no, no. Eh, eh, you know, and they were kind of went back and forth on it for a while, and eventually they were like, "Okay, well, let, let's call him and pull him in." And it's perfect. Yes, you are exactly right for this role. <laughs> wow, a crazy wow. idea train engaged. Yeah, exactly. yeah. There we go. <laughs> um, and for those not not clear, um, Anno answered an ad um, to work on Nausicaa the Valley of Wind. He was an animator on that. Um, they go way back. <clears throat> They've known each other for a long time. Um, so it, it was, it was not a, you know, oh yeah, that guy, right? It was, they, they, they were familiar with him. Uh, and yet he voiced the, the main character in a, yeah. uh, Ghibli film, um, which went to Joseph Gordon-Levitt, in, in case folks are, are curious. But yeah, I mean, you know, Martin Short and Elijah Wood are in yeah. this movie. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's got quite the cast. Um, Andy Patinkin, um, yeah. William H. Macy. Stan, Stanley Tucci. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, wow! In Disney? sub, you don't hear any of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Disney brought in um, all the uh, all, all the folks as they tend to do, and I think Michelle Ruff is in there too. I think they, they brought in an anime voice actor. They tend to, they, like, they like to do that. Um, but yeah, interesting interesting voice cast. Um, um, and so this very much deals with the, how things are changing politically. This whole scene and sequence with how you know. Um, one has to be more careful with one's words at this yes. point. Um, I, I do love that that moment where uh, um, you know, they're talking about, about about exactly that, and somebody walks by and he goes, "Yes, the strawberries are lovely, and I really enjoyed walking in the in the woods or whatever." And they go back to their conversation because there's almost a comedic element to it. Like it is such an abrupt change, and the the topic is so banal, you almost. It's almost like he's announcing to the other person, I am speaking a banal thing, pay no attention to me. Right. And so you wonder how much of that is going on, of just, you know, we all have to do this. Uh. Which is such an interesting reaction to the end of the Taisho era and the beginning of the Showa era. Yeah. How the, it politically, not only had the shift moved to the right, mm. but the idea of the internationalism of the Taisho period mm. It's sunset at the end of the Taisho period. Right. And that you started to see the rise of a nationalistic political awareness that tried to eliminate or, or at least suppress as much as possible mm -hmm. the liberal Western mm -hmm. concepts mm -hmm. in favor of Japanese-ness. Yeah. Like things that were native concepts to, to being Japanese mm -hmm. and that these other influences should be done away with because yeah. they were eroding the immoral and political character of Japan. Mm -hmm. 
And that included things like democracy and right. freedom of speech <laughs> and right of association. Yeah. yeah. And it's fascinating how that comes in waves because that was a, a, a big thing in, during the major restoration. Uh, we, we, need, we need our Japanese uniqueness and we need to you know, hold tight to these ideals. Like, you know, we'll, we'll look at how they do things. Like we'll, you know, we'll copy their engines, but we'll do it the Japanese way. Right. Um, with oxen. Then, right, with oxen. With oxen. Exactly. <laughs> and then that kind of waned during the Taisho period, and then it came back with a force. Yeah. Uh, afterwards. Um, uh, yeah, and then, uh, again, he goes outside, and, and uh, uh, yeah, we have the paper airplane scene, which is sweet. Again, it, it's really nice. It's, it's really lovely. It's just... Goes on. <laughs> it does on, go on. And it goes on. on. Um, and it's like They're driving I, home a point. <laughs> they are. They are they keep driving that home oh. point. At two by four. Thank you, sir. May I have another? <laughs> exactly. You'll keep getting them. Don't you worry. <laughs> Don't even need to ask. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, but they're they're lovebirds, and it's sweet, and it's it's lovely. Um, Till they almost die falling out. Yeah. Well, you know, whatever. Um, it brings them closer. Brings them closer um, to and death. I think. <laughs> well, I think this is where they. Where is it where they find it? Um, where, where, where he finds out? Um, is this where he finds out she has TB? Mm. Or is it later? I forget. Uh, I think it's later. I think um, it's right after. I think it's right after. The, okay. I was gonna say. Yeah, it's, it's right after this. the planes. Yeah, it's around. I think it's right after the planes because yeah. she just disappears and he doesn't know why. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah, and yep. then that's where he starts to learn that she was con- she was convalescent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for her health. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we, we come back, we get the the aluminum parts, uh, which everyone finds kind of stunning. Um, and Jiro's like, nope, like this is the future. We got we got to do this. Um, which again, in Japan at that time, resource uh, yep. poor kind of world. Right. Yeah. Solid and well made aluminum parts would have been fantabulously expensive. I have yeah. no doubt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. Well, yeah, the fact that these you know airplane designers are looking at them like they're from Mars, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of tells you how rare they are. Oof. Um, Which um, I can't even imagine. I mean, maybe okay, yeah. in Manchuria, mm. up in Harbin, I. There, I, I'm not entirely sure what the resource index was for Manchuria at the time, but I think yeah. they had access to some mm. uh, precious metals like bauxite, mm-hmm. which you refine down right, down into yeah. aluminum. But mm. it, by you know, tiny comparison with anything that would have been available to any of the European Western powers yeah. and their colonial empire, mm-hmm. so that really, you know, well, I mean, that really strangleholded their yeah. <laughs> their ability to do these things. Yeah. Which is why they needed to expand, you understand. This is why we need to conquer mm. you know, the entire Eastern world. The East uh, Asian co-prosperity sphere. They were going to bring everybody together hey. and forward <laughs> under their authority. authority. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Benevolent. <laughs> benevolent. Yeah. Right. Benevolent. 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 Reading this book's in a, on in a benevolent world. despotism half day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um... Uh, we love this book, The Prince. Oh, damn it. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, and here's where he, find out, he finds out that she's collapsed. Um, and, and he goes uh, on the train, still doing his formulas on the train with the slide rule, um, which I, I did appreciate that um, as he's tearing up. Um, and then goes into this you know, very Western house. Um, um, and that's where he, he discovers, like you say, that she has TB. Um, and to be clear, TB was incurable at the time. Um, you could potentially kind of shake it off and like live out the rest of your, your life if you were lucky, but there was no way of curing it, you know, um, hopefully you could just kind of live the rest of your life kind of mildly ill. Um, but it was, it was not a good thing to have. Yeah. So when they send people like Arizona. And like yeah, Texas, right. where it's like, oh, the dry air will help you. It's like, yeah, it's not going to cure you though. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, it's breathing a little bit easier as you die, but yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. That, that was all yeah. they could do. Yeah, yeah. I so okay. So you guys might appreciate this. So as I'm watching the slide will appear over and over again in mm-hmm. the movie, I'm thinking back to my school days, mm. right and 
Let me get my walker out. <laughs> Do you use a slide rule? Yes. Wow. Oh, cool. Way back in the day. I don't even think I have one anymore. But it was like way back in the day. And we, oh, wow. when I was in when I was in junior high school, seventh grade, you had to go if you were going into uh, above algebra one, mm -hmm. you had to go through a course to learn how to use a slide rule. Wow. Damn. So so you know you bought the slide rule and that's the thing that you had and you know of course you did your calculations on that and you had to understand how you tabulate and mm -hmm. do all that stuff and, and, and by the way i'm not trying to say make myself sound smart because i'm dumb as hell when it comes to arithmetic <laughs> so the slide rule was both a blessing and a curse to me mm -hmm. so just, just give you an idea but you could hit other children with it but you couldn't I, see, use it as you know, a tool. you know it's a weapon really good hefty you know no, but but no, it, it just reminded me of that. But then, you know, and they don't really show it in the movie, but, you know, I would, for people who actually really could use it far better than I ever could, um, the way the speed that you, you move with it and how, what a lot of people don't understand is that the movements, it's, it's, it's its own miracle piece of engineering. Yes. You know, the way that it moves, the way that you move it, move it around and use the, you know, the little bar. And how everything glides, and how you're supposed to look at it instantly. Like you're supposed to be able to blah blah blah, blah do your little calculation. Mm -hmm. Okay, boom. Yep. And that's why, and that's why you have like you see him doing tables all the time because that's what you use the slide rule with, mm -hmm. is is with tables. Jeez. So I was like thinking about that as as they're going through it, and then and then there's the scene where you know I don't want to get too far ahead, but he's doing it one handed. I'm like, going, oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yep. uh, yeah, but yeah. It, but it's kind of interesting because that is an important piece of technology for engineering at that yeah. time. That was mm -hmm. that was that was the calculator. That, yeah, that's exactly what yeah. it was. Mm -hmm. Yep, this is your computer, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. Wow. Very large I found, my, I found my brother's uh, slide rule, mm -hmm. at, and when I found it, and I was supposed to have been in grade school myself, I looked at it, I'm like, what the hell is this? Thing? <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> this is the stupidest ruler I've ever seen in my life. What is it doesn't measure almost... a damn thing. <laughs> yeah, why is it the thing that slides here and this thing that moves over there, and it's not? it doesn't use anything? I throw that away. <laughs> Put it back in the box in the basement. Like, I don't know what this is. That it doesn't even have on this. I think they had just introduced the Casio uh, calculator watches. Uh, mm. Oh yeah. So, <laughs> so not only was that then a thing that you could like do stuff with, but it also became instantly the thing that you couldn't wear in class. Right. But, yeah. Mm. Like, no, oh, you can't have a calculator watch. Like, uh, but I'm adding with this thing. What are you doing? <laughs> you have to use. No, it's true. They're just like, no, yeah. you can't use a calculator. You have to use a slide rule because this is what's your, what you're going to be using your job from here on in when you wow. do engineering. Boy, were they wrong. <laughs> yeah, technology well, marched forward and killed yeah. killed the abacus. Exactly, I mean, yeah. the uh, slide roll. <laughs> <laughs> Although, actually, the abacus um, has a bit of a comeback recently. Um, um, I was watching an interesting thing that people are, are um, especially in Asia, um, teaching the abacus to children because they found um, you actually have a different view of how math works if you think of it the way an abacus works. And there's some there's some amazing images hmm. of kids who are able to do calculations rapidly in their head, and you when they do that you actually see them do this. Oh, for all the beads! You can imagine yeah, moving, but they can they can do it in their heads, and like it's just it's this very different way of thinking about numbers. It's fascinating. Interesting. Yeah, so it's sort of a math trick, huh. math hack, if you will. Huh. Cool. Um, but anyway, um, that is not what's going on in the winter crisis. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, but we see they've they've fallen in love. Um, which is which is nice, um, um, and then uh, Geo starts to move forward more with the the zero, and making it just more advanced. You know that that kind of uh, driver, and then this interesting moment um, um, where he says, you know, we don't have you know, we have a weight problem, so we'll just remove the guns. Right, and everyone pauses and then uh -huh. bursts out laughing. Um, and then he says, well, we'll just move forward with this for now. And you wonder how much of that is sort of him sort of tweaking the, you know, the audience, you know, sort of going, you know, I, I wish we could do this, but we can't, uh, yeah. moving along. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And then again, we, we cut back to her convalescing again, uh, in that, that wonderful cold air, make sure you get lots of cold air in your lungs when you have TB. 
Uh, um, it reduces the swelling. Right. Or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, granted, it's better than, you know, you should stay shut up at home with no access to any circulation and ventilation at all. Yeah. Coughing up blood all the time. Right. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Uh, try something. Um, then he sees her. Uh, they're reunited in a, in a lovely little moment. And here's where we point out none of this is real. <laughs> none of this is historical. Uh, this is all based on a famous Japanese uh, uh, novel um, about the, the doomed love between uh, a man and a woman. Uh, Jiro's widow attended the premiere of The Wind Rises. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she made a miraculous 11th hour recovery yeah. from TV. No, she it's never had it. it. No. <laughs> Damn it, you people. Um, and again, Miyazaki, this is kind of how he figured out his end to the story of realizing, oh, if I add a love story on top of it, then it's not just this story of, you know, war. There's also kind of the, the, the relationship between him and the idea of loss and what he loses as a result of all this. Yeah, I was going to say, because, you know, this is the movie that we go, okay, or not just this movie, but this is the part where he goes, okay, we'll put in some romance and um, make you cry. Yeah. Because <laughs> when I was looking up at this, we not... talk about this, like, you know, plane that, you know, kills. It's going to murder millions. Tens of thousands you know, of people. Tens yeah. of thousands of folks have fell at the hands of these things. Yeah. It's, so, you know, when I was looking at this movie, uh, looking up the IMDb synopsis and stuff, it's just like the first thing that, that kept up coming up on Google was, Top 10 saddest anime, and usually <laughs> number six or seven, and you know, the wind always, are, and I'm like, one, oh, damn it, Brett, we just got done with Lane. <laughs> That's this the weird a, thing, though. This is a direct kind of sadness versus Lane, <laughs> which is a lot more mental sadness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing, is that, um, you know, there's definitely, definitely sadness to this yeah. whole thing, but it, it is so clearly established. Like, you know what's coming. You yeah. know, you, you, you know this is going to happen. Um, and they are both very accepting of that. Um, you know, they realize what's happening and, and they're both just eff effectively fine with it. Um, I actually don't find the movie that sad, weirdly. Um, it's definitely tr a tragedy, but it doesn't have that gut punch that I get well, no, it's months. no grave. No, yeah. no. Well, yeah. But there was, you know, yeah. it's, but, you know, when you get that point, oh, she has tuber tuberculosis. <laughs> mm. This is where we're going. Thank okay. you. Yeah. All yeah. right. Exactly. We'll we have another. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> mm. But I mean, it, it adds, you know, certainly, you're, you're, you're right. It's, you know, the idea of it's just not just war. Mm. So I was like, that would, it's, I still think the way that they've done this, mm. it would be a really interesting, the designer of the Zero story. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. It would, you know, would people really go to it well, just see, for yeah, that? Right, yeah. You gave a yeah. little bit of the romance for some, you give a little bit of a war for others, and it's like... But the know, heroine looks a little like Kiki. I mean, come <laughs> on. It draws people in. Exactly, exactly. Um, it must also be pointed out that um, not long before uh, Miyazaki decided to make The Wind Rises, um, Isao Takahata had announced he was going to make the princess, Taylor Princess Kaguya. Um, so there's speculation there may have been a little bit of well if Takahata is going to make something you know, <laughs> I, I, I need to make something and you know and then, and then now I'm competing with Takahata on this you know lavish animation spectacle um, you know with all of this emotional stuff going on so who knows uh, how much that was driving me as well um, uh, so yeah the other interesting thing about this is that uh, you know Miyazaki um, famously writes his stories more or less linearly, where he just starts storyboarding and then just starts working and then they start animating and then eventually he starts doing more storyboards when they need more storyboards uh, and just kind of builds and builds and builds and builds. So there's, he doesn't like plan everything out and say, okay, here's the ending. They can be like halfway through production and he still doesn't know what the ending is going to be. Um, famously. So, uh, which, which is great when you're working on a, you know, big, big budget animated film. So it the is also. Animators, I swear to God, <laughs> I have to redo this thing. I'm gonna... Hey, no. this is the perfect way to avoid spoilers, right? You don't want you don't yeah. want loose lips sinking ships here. Exactly, right. So you just don't know where it's going to go. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so therefore, nobody can spoil anything. Yeah. Oh, good to know. Um, this is actually the prequel to Nausicaa. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, there, there are connected Miyazaki movies. We know that much. 
Uh, but yeah, that's um, I. This is I, happening on the other side of the planet. War in the pocket Gundam. Uh, what? What? Uh, okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> and a Valkyrie flies in. Is um, right? <laughs> <laughs> Macron. Hey, Anna's <laughs> voicing a character. It could happen. There you go. Um, anything's possible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I do wonder. I mean, it, it is kind of notable that you know halfway through the movie, suddenly, you know what we need—a romance plot. We just kind of go in there. Like, okay, all right, you're not. I don't know. I don't know. Well, me and Zach have been spending a lot of days like drawing skirts on girls in the <laughs> closet. So just suddenly got struck him about a romance. Well, what the hell? <laughs> sure. Oh dear. Um, uh, yeah, and so um, sister shows up. We get a little bit more about the sister and kind of what, what she's dealing with, um, and her frustrations with, with kind of Jiro there, um, and then we do get this wonderfully touching scene uh, of him working and then um, holding her hand uh, as she's just kind of laying there, uh, which I think is just kind of the, the summary of their relationship. Um, that you know he does his thing, she's just kind of resting and relaxing, but they're connected. Um, yeah, you know, and they're they're, they're caring for each other. Um, in that, in the, the best way they can. Um, and then there's the boy, you know, there's a zero. Um, yeah. they built the thing. It is, it is a, it is a plane. Um, one of the other things Miyazaki talked about is how the heck do you end this movie? <laughs> <laughs> Cause it's, it's a movie about, you know, a war plane. And so do you end it with, and so lots of people died, uh, which is kind of what he does. But, you know, and he said the climax of the movie could not be, um, you know, and then, oh, great, we made the zero and then went and bombed him and killed a bunch of people. You know, it had to be some other kind of ending. Um, and we won the war. Right? Whoa, dude. Yeah, yeah, whoa, yeah, yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. No. Yeah, yeah. Step back from that, mister. <laughs> <laughs> that would not go over well. No, um, that would not. Some, um um, but instead, um, we get uh, just more of, of, um, and then I, I will admit kind of the, the sadness of her getting up, let, seeing him leave and then getting dressed, um, and leaving. Um, and you realize she, she's going off back to convalesce, um, and to basically die. Um, yeah. but what's interesting about this to me, um, and I don't know how much of this is in, in your general story, like you would expect the ending to be she stays there by her his side until one night she passes away in her sleep or whatever, right? It's interesting that she decides to go away to kind of prolong her life. Um, that that's kind of what he wants for her. That she realizes that just, you know, tiring herself out, you know, wouldn't make him happy. He wants her to do the best thing for her and keep her health up as long as possible. Um, and I, I did appreciate that. Um... Again, not kind of, not, not as not as as sad and tragic as Miyazaki could have made it. Uh. Well, it's also it's interesting for for their home life and the things that are going on around him. Mm -hmm. They don't show a lot of the privation that you saw no, in like no, Brave or that you've right. seen a lot not of other all. like wartime things. Mm -hmm. That you know you don't see taped up windows. You don't see like rationing. You don't see any yeah. or hear any discussion about. Yeah, so you know, I'm gonna take lunch, uh, but all I can afford, you know, afford to eat is this like one single onigiri. That's what I have for food today. Mm -hmm. It's like they don't yeah. really address that. Yeah, and it's just like true. That's, and I'm not gonna say it's it's sanitizing, but sure. I think it's. <clears throat> I I would presume that Miyazaki is like this is a thing we all know. You know, right. this this yeah. is a thing that happened right. during the time. Well, I don't need to address well, that. Also, yeah. We also, can just we can just focus on other things. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's a family movie, you're you're not gonna, you know talk about those things you know, right necessarily yeah. um you know the lack of food or, or anything like that well and also i think there there is a, an element that he got he not necessarily making the point but they're a wealthy family and they are well yeah. taken care of by the government and so right. they, have, they do not have privation and so i think you're absolutely right that it's you know it's kind of i'm slightly surprised that miyazaki doesn't have anyone mention boy it's a good thing we live here because um, yeah. that would be a, a, a great way of highlighting the fact that this is an issue. And we had the, the, the sequence earlier of the, the kids in the street. Right. Well, you know, well, I mean, think of Firefly, too. It's like yeah. the aunt makes the point, be like, well, you're kids of a naval man. Mm. 
you guys must yeah, have pretty yeah. good. Mm-hmm. And it's like yeah. nobody has said anything like that. Mm. Oh, you're a government contract. You must have pretty good. Yeah. It's like, nope, well, nope, know. we're not going to address that. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, you know, it's interesting that, that it just, just occurred to me because that kind of flies in the face of this whole socialist wonder. Yeah. Wonder event. It does. Because, you know, because, <clears throat> like, you know, if he, if they're wealthy, or at the very least, he's being taken care of by the corporation mm-hmm. who is spending money on him and protecting him as an <laughs> asset. Yeah. And, um, but at the same time, using him for the government that's trying to get it. I, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, thank you for hurting my head on that one. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> but you know, it just kind of flies in the face of that, where it's just kind of like going, okay, well, you know, if you're a really socialist, then you would talk about sharing the burden, yeah, you know, kind of thing. But there, but you're right. There's no, he has no real um, concept of lack of funding. He's all, nope. he's he's able to smoke. Right. He's able to have cigarettes. He's mm-hmm. able to, yep. you know, do these things, and he's provided for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's an it, it's an interesting statement to not make the statement. Yeah, you know, right. like, yeah. she just avoided the wartime provisions. <laughs> like, interesting. Okay, that's mm-hmm. a, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah, notable, notable. Put aside the uncomfortable stuff and let's just focus on this <laughs> yeah. story. Mm-hmm. A man, she a has tuberculosis. Right. Come on. <laughs> How much more do we need? Um. Um. Yeah. Orphans. We need orphans. We need no. orphans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that'll make this film. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a hard enough one. <laughs> <laughs> the wind rises. Daddy Warbucks should have been <laughs> Um Oh, jeez. <laughs> but yes, the zero. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the zero. Ha ha. See what I did there. <laughs> um, <laughs> does fly mm-hmm. successfully, um, and we get this. I think really well-considered ending where you see them all flying off um, into this the sky sort of triumphantly um, but then you also see a, a, a grave of the zeros if you will of all of these mangled destroyed planes because that was ultimately their fate yep um, uh, and then Jiro walking through those in a very sort of Nausicaa castle in the sky kind of moment of all the destroyed uh, uh, things, and then talking to um, um, Caproni. Caproni, thank you, um, and uh, asking kind of what, what what's it all for. And to your point, it's like, well, at least you got to, you got to make the thing. You know, that was kind of your you you, you want to make the thing, you made the thing. Um, the, what can you do, yep. basically? Um, also, go, and sometimes go, I meant to mention cursed. Go. Yeah, I meant to go to mention going back about the the machine gun thing. Mm. Is that ultimately the zero was as fast as it was because they did not armor the cockpit for the for the pilots. Uh, that yeah. they omitted things like self sealing fuel Moon tanks, which tanks. required rubber right. liners in the gas tanks. Mm. So if they were pierced by something, they would seal again. You would leak, mm. and it would also explode. Uh, so yeah. that one of the allied uh, factors that they learned was like, oh. You know, not only do tracers work great if you put them, you know, in a certain sequence, you can mm. see where you're firing mm. things. But tracers are also incendiaries, oh, which wow. when you have yeah. a non-sealing tank and you pierce it, it allows air in, air fuel oh. mixture with an incendiary device. These things explode. <laughs> hey, super. And when they were, and was wow. it? The, it was the Mustang or the P-38 that the Navy used in the Pacific. I forget which one. Uh, it was the, the, the one that the moved really slow. Boeing and Vought Corsair. Which Corsair, was the gull wing Corsair. Long, Corsair. That's it. Okay. Um, they used P 38s, which they shot down Isoroku Yamamoto, his right. transport aircraft. Aircraft. Right. So, you know, any of the given planes would work well because you figure things like P 47s, 51s, any of the planes that we had had an armored, armored plate going, right. for the cockpit so that the pilot, at least above the cockpit, you know, mm-hmm. walls, mm-hmm. the window portion, you weren't really. Yeah. going to be in too much help but if you got shot at the side or under your butt you weren't going to catch around zero pilots it would go right through the aluminum yeah. skin yeah <laughs> and it's just like okay as yeah. long as they were the fastest Let's thing just, in the sky mm-hmm. they had a great turns. chance of doing it yeah but the minute they weren't the fastest oh it was just ugly yeah so hence yeah. the graveyard of the zeros it's like yeah, yeah you're you're sacrificed for weight you put the guns on it, but you didn't put the other safety features. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, yeah. 
um, uh, yeah, um, and of course he, he sees his wife there, um, um, and that's the ending. <laughs> it's just him you have off. to live. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, well no, he's in a dream right now. So is he like <laughs> shot or something? Is he starvation? What, what's going on here that he has to live? And then Caproni goes, "Come on with me. Let's drink some wine." Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then, I wish my bad weeks would end like that. <laughs> with an Italian see. offering you wine in a fantasy scape. <laughs> wow, Steve. Yeah. Sounds like that might make, make for an interesting move. Wait a minute, let's move your hey. here. Hey, um, <laughs> there we are. Um, uh, yeah, and that's 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 where we end. Um, boy, I have complicated feelings about this movie. Because <laughs> um, as an animation fan, oh my gosh, like it's given me mm -hmm. all of the animations. Um, but as a story. <sighs> Um, like, the little sister is just kind of there. Um, you know, the, the little kids are just, the, the, the street rats are just kind of there. Um, right. you know, we kind of make this hard left turn into the romance plot line. Um, and the fact that there's no mention made of the historicity or lack thereof of that is just kind of weird. Um, and to your guys' point, the lack of attention made to some of the the things that happened at the time that seemed like important points to make but again you know, you have untold numbers of japanese films that made that point so maybe he's like we you know okay we we we've, we've made the point um but yeah just the storytelling really feels all over the place here and just a lot of of scenes that just kind of go on and go on and go on um and you know you contrast this to like you were saying with nausicaa um, Porco Rosso, much more economical films. Yeah. Um, yeah. This just doesn't feel like that. I think that I, honestly, it feels like they, when I, after I watched it, I was like, wow, he struggled with this. Like he didn't mm. know how to, to bridge the, the beginning, the middle and the end. I mean, they were three separate movies. Yeah. I mean, the, the beginning is, it's, is, it is a completely different movie from the rest of the movie. It's, yeah. it's could be its own thing. Right. And then you have the romance and that can be its own thing. And then it was just like, I have to tie this all together somehow. <laughs> and so I'm going to go that way, mm -hmm. you know, and you just go with it. And it was, I just don't think it was a very effective story. Mm -hmm. But you're right about the animation. The animation, as always with the Ghibli <sighs> movie, is, right. is usually just, you know, outstanding and mm -hmm. Like part of me was just like, going, what if I just, you know, took out some of the, you know, the, the really tiresome parts and just put like, you know, turn it from 120 minutes to 90 minutes and mm. just put it to music, mm. you know, yeah. like for the dream sequences yeah. and things like that. And yeah. just mm. let it run. And I was just, I was like thinking to myself, what that would probably be a more joy of a movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's certainly one of those, one of those experiences for, for a Ghibli film where it's like, I was expecting more fantastical. Mm, um, interesting. And it was mm -hmm. certainly much more grounded. Yep. I mean, it's a very grounded thing that happened in mm -hmm. its time. Yep. And <clears throat> it just kind of left me sitting back and going, okay, Porco Rosso is grounded by the machinery that's flying. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not super fantastical. It's the story that's more the fantastical element of mm -hmm. it. That's, you know, right. The things that are going on. Right. And it's like, I what i don't I, I couldn't put my finger on it's like why was this amongst all the other catalog of ghibli things to do yeah. why was this the thing you put your thumb on at that time right. and yeah. we know the way he makes films mm -hmm. this is not you know it's a tuesday my god let's make this film by friday <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. we're talking you know how many years. years was this cooking around in the back of his head yep before he started like launching into this, what precipitated this? Because I think you're absolutely right, Steve. There's so there's so many different stop points in this where you could just end it there and then have a separate thing. Yeah. And it's just like, is that are we looking at the thinking process? The initial idea happened, we have part A. Mm -hmm. And then the consideration of, well, yeah, something emotional will be good in this. So part B. Mm -hmm. And but uh 
well, end it. <laughs> See. <laughs> you know what I mean? Is that yeah. how this went? Because you know that would kind of make some more sense. Yeah. Because I, I don't. It just I don't see how this spawned out of like you know here's Spirit Away, here's Pawn, yeah. here's all these other shows, mm-hmm. and there's then there's this. Mm-hmm. Beautiful yeah. to watch. The animation is, you know, like like you said, Brent. It's lavish animation. It's beautiful mm-hmm. to watch these things, and it's it's interesting. But it's just really a curiosity amongst yeah. the other pantheon of of and films. Granted, like my neighbors, the Yamadas, is also very much an anomaly among Ghibli films. Like, it doesn't look like anything else. It doesn't feel like anything else. Um, it's a fascinating film, uh, just because it's it's so distinct that it's sort of. Japanese peanuts, but you know, yeah. whatever. Um, and and but I, I completely agree. This this feels like it's just the odd one out in, yeah. in a lot of the, the, the things he does. And uh, um, I don't know. Well, and, and even Miyazaki said that he said, "I don't I don't know." Yeah, you know, <laughs> there are many reasons not to make this film, but this is the film I want to make right now. Um, <laughs> and I just love to know what what pulled him in and and why why this. Why at that point, um, and and why this thing? But like we said, you know, uh, <coughs> spirited away, as we mentioned before, he didn't know what the ending was, and he just kind of pulled No Face in as the as the villain or the antagonist. Right. Um, I think that, that ultimately worked out. It's a very interesting uh, thing. But let's be honest, you know, and I and I adore Spirited Away, but that last third kind of wanders a bit. Um, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting sequence, the whole, you know, the train over the water thing, but it right. does, it's kind of abrupt, um, and it feels kind of, kind of odd. And I think you, you see that kind of in the wind rises where it's kind of this, okay. <sighs> Which I, I think you can, you can not say you can't, it's mm-hmm. Miyazaki. Um, <laughs> spirited away, you can get away with that because it is in the fantastical. Right. So yeah. that's right. some yeah. things that, you know, the, the, the. Oh, what is Very it? The theologic. acceptance. Yeah. The, well, this the acceptance of the ambiguous. Mm, yes. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like there's some ambiguity in there that you're just like, yeah, but that's fine. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, a fantastical yeah. mm-hmm. world. But when you have this one that's semi grounded in reality, mm-hmm. that it's like you have a kind of a greater expectation about that it's going to. If it, you're not going to do a fantastical, then it's going to follow sort of a more logical pr- progression. And it's like, mm-hmm. it's just interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's hard because uh, I don't know. Um, like when I watch the movie, I'm always drawn in, but it's probably the one Miyazaki movie I would be last to go back to, you know, um, um, uh, which is, which is a shame. Um, and, and it's weird because I think you know, Miyazaki's obviously a genius. He does all sorts of amazing things, but this one just... Yeah, maybe he was right. I mean, maybe it was just an idea in his head he needed to get out. And yeah. he thought, well, right. I'll just make a manga out of it. Yeah. And it'll be done. It'll yeah. be done. Yeah. It's just, it's the idea. Maybe that's that was the problem. It just never left his head, and this was the only way he could get it out. Right. Yeah. But I can just imagine someone having that studio giveaway collection going, oh, da, 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 da. Yeah. Because, <laughs> right. you know. Yeah. And, you know, we, we should give creatives <clears throat> the opportunity to make things that are weird and, uh, you know, right, right, not sure, their normal yeah. thing. And, okay, fine. That was what you had to make that time. That happens. Well, you know. Here's a question. When did Nadia Blue Water come out? 91? Maybe was it that, when, that early? I thought when it was did 90... this film come out? Oh, 2013? Uh, 13? Yeah. 2013. Because you think about the, the kid in Nadia. He is a technical whiz. He's mm. fascinated with flying yeah. and designing yeah. and building engines and planes mm. and everything else. Huh. And it's like, if you had mm. kind of skewed this that way to the mm. more fantastical, yeah. I think I would have I would have felt greater about the the, the film mm. as opposed to grounding it in reality and then when I go and read up on the guy's wife did <laughs> not die of TV I, I, I'll be honest I felt like a little like oh you were manipulating mm. me that's a <laughs> jackass move to use yeah. that's terrible mm-hmm. well, well the yeah. only two fantastical elements to this and Brent you and I talked about it briefly earlier today 
was first of all the the earthquake scene where it yeah. seemed like something was supposed to be underneath like something alive underneath mm -hmm. the ground that was moving and then the fact that human voices were used for mechanical purposes yeah you know for like when they're winding up the plane the zero with the, with the crankshaft and you know various other things and actually the noises of the aftershocks were, were human voices yeah. i think yeah. and and right and those and so that was like i i guess that was the the closest thing you got to to fantasy in that was just yeah. like all these weird noises because otherwise there, there really wasn't anything and i don't think you could put it at a, at a fantastical to, mm -hmm. that, to this thing yeah i think any more fantastical and it would have I guess if you want to make it more fantastical, it couldn't really be about Jiro and right. going to zero and so forth and so on because that's such a heavy topic. Right. You know, how, how do yeah. you do that? And I, I, I agree with you, John, that I, I would love to see that take on this. I would love to see John. Uh, hey, John, John. Anyway, um, ah. yeah, I'd love to see him take on It was 1990, by the way, uh, the original broadcast of 1960 yeah. Water. Wow. Um, but I mean, you in that like talking about you know the things that are going on in Japan at the time that Miyazaki sort of skates over because yeah. it was well known. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to address certain things because that yeah. was kind of understood. There's mm -hmm. parts of the Great Kanto Quake mm -hmm. that have been covered that presumably we don't mm -hmm. we don't know about. That maybe this wow. is there's a lot of visual shortcuts to it. Mm -hmm. You could have done a more fantastical, mm -hmm. like you would have had. With Jean, if you didn't make it about specifically Jiro mm. and the development of the Zero, but you made it of Jean mm -hmm. of like character mm -hmm. and the development of his dream aircraft yeah. that had war applications, mm -hmm. like Wings of Hanamazu. Yeah, yeah. If you had had yeah. somebody in that world mm -hmm. who designed the crazy double propeller plant, yeah. you could have told right. the story of the Zero developer right. as through this third person who's a fantastical fantasy person mm -hmm. and then the resultant consequences of developing your yeah. dream machine that's used for war mm -hmm. you, you yeah. know what i mean it's like so but I'm, i would never second guess miyazaki sure that's, yeah that's, 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 <laughs> never. not in a million years yeah it's his vision it's what he's doing with it but it's like i it just it would it, i would feel more like continuity out of you've done that with it so yeah mm. completely agreed yeah um any other thoughts on the wind rises before we move on i loved the earthquake series yeah. uh, that was just yeah. really yeah. A, a neat it, th this um, is i mean peace as far as i know i i don't know of any other representation in like visual media of the great kanto earthquake i think this is it like thank you miyazaki yeah. for finally giving us you know a, a vision of what that looked like yeah Gosh. well i'd love to know how they did when you see the pulse from the bay come yeah, in yeah. and you see it it rolls across the the 2d landscape mm -hmm. how how yeah what what film process did you do to get that to i, I mean, mean is that just the insanity of the of the animation or is yeah. there a process that gets you that pulse wave because yeah you could see it looks like it's over top of the whole thing yeah i mean i gotta admit it it looks like it might actually just be like a photoshop filter um it looks it's, like it's just kind of slightly more gray, slightly more gray, overlaid, right. and then just, you know, going whiter. Huh. But it's a, it's a neat effect because, yeah, you, you know, absolutely. you don't have from that distance, you don't, you're not going to see the ground pitch yet. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, but that pulse is just really visually, visually, visually attractive to, you know, you're looking at this like, wow, how yeah. the hell that happened? Yeah. How'd they do that? Yeah. What's happening? Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Like so, I, that was I. I think a, a brilliant representation of the Great Kanto Quake. Mm -hmm. So, agreed. Cool. Well, I think that will do it for us then. Um, thank you so much. We will be back momentarily with some um, some more stuff. <laughs>